Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. As we continue the study in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this morning and possibly this evening, um, we're going to be studying on the murder of John the Baptist. So starting in verse 14 here, Starting in verse 14 of Mark chapter 6, the Bible says, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said and that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is arisen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For he married her, and John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and noticed this, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of and when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask me, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, well, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste and said unto the king, And asked, saying, I will that you thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his own sake, and for their sake which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king set an executioner, and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we are again in your word, studying through the Gospel of Mark, Lord. And this morning we learned in Sunday school about those who gave their life so that we could eventually hold this word in our hand. This afternoon we learn about those who gave their life preaching the contents of this book, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that even this morning, as as we hold this word, we not only think about those who died so that we could have it, Lord, but we think about the one who died for it so that we could have this gospel, Lord. I pray that you'll strengthen us this morning, Lord. We know the effects and the affairs of this life are weighing heavy upon us even now, Lord. Up until we hit the door, re constant reminder after reminder of the troubles of this life, death, disease, or worry, stress. Lord, give us this moment. Set everything aside. Bind Satan, Lord, as we dive into your word. Feed us, Lord, and encourage us here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The news has now spread abroad. It's spread all the way to the home of Herod. The gospel news, the gospel message, the word which is being preached by Jesus Christ, the word which is being preached by his disciples is now spread abroad and has made it all the way to the home of Herod. 
In this portion of the Gospel of Mark, we have seen as we've worked through the Gospel of Mark, the progression of the Gospel. And But here, the Gospel ministry, we know that the, last week we just covered as the Lord sent out the disciples. But here as the gospel ministry is moving forward, we've paused for a brief moment to see the life of John the Baptist. It was believed all the way back in uh, when we opened up and studied in Mark chapter 1, right after the baptism of Jesus Christ. It's believed to be somewhere around that time in which John the Baptist was seized and taken in the, into prison. Uh, probably they believe that a year has passed since this time, meaning since Mark chapter 1 to Mark chapter 6, roughly they believe a year has passed. Passed a year into our Lord's three year earthly ministry. We seen last week that he sent the 12 and they too went and did miracles and preached the gospel. And while ministry is moving forward, we stop for a minute to get an update on this amazing prophet, this amazing preacher, John the Baptist. Remember the one who was written about in the Old Testament. So this is the one who we are speaking of. This prophet who burst on the scene, shouting the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, one who is pre preaching repentance, one who is preaching the remission of sins. A mighty man of God is now on the scene. He was the one who was to lay the footwork for Christ. He was the one who was to bring people to the reality of where they stood. I love how Luke puts it, speaking about John the Baptist, because when you take in how Luke words it, you kind of see the condition of the nation. In Luke verse one, chapter 1 and verse 17, he says, and he shall go f and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient unto the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, what was the climate of the times when John the Baptist comes on the scene? People's hearts were broken. The, the very thought process that it was part of John's John the Baptist's ministry to turn the hearts of their fathers back to the children means that it was at a time and an age where the hearts of the fathers were not for their children. When we see that John's ministry was to preach repentance, when it was to preach the remission of sins, when it was a time to turn the disobedient to the heart of wisdom, to, to, to turn them to the just, to the wisdom of the just. We really begin to understand what climate John the Baptist entered in. And there was no shortage of disobedient people to the word of God. But John preached his message and it turned the hearts of the wicked to the Lord. It was a time of broken homes. It was a time of broken societies when John comes on this scene. When he comes on the scene, John does not enter the scene doing miracles. He doesn't do, enter the scene doing things that, that amaze people. John enters the scene and what amazes people is the message that he has. What amazes people is the power that he has in his voice. What amazes people is that John was fearless as he preached the word. He, John had an amazing thing. He realized the authority of the word of God. He realized the power of the word of God. When John spoke, when John preached, he didn't waver to the left or to the right. He didn't wonder if what he was saying is true. He knew it. And from the depths of his soul, he shouted. He made it clear. He let everyone know about the truth of the word of God. He passionately delivered the word of God. He was fearless with it. Everywhere he turned, the zeal spilled out of him. And by the way, there's this thing today when you think about John the Baptist, about how much passion he had, about how much power he had, about how much boldness he has. Man, John the Baptist would not fit in so well today because the mentality of people today maybe not here but around the world is we don't want a preacher who preaches on sin we don't want a preacher who's passionate about wickedness we just want a preacher when I come here he makes me feel good and I go home feeling good it's a feel good age you would have not have fared well in 
in the days of John the Baptist. By the way, you wouldn't have fared well good in the days of Jesus. Why is that? Because when Herod hears about the preaching of this man, when Herod hears about the fame that spread abroad, when Herod hears about the power that rests in this man, the first thing that comes to his mind is this is John the Baptist. Surely there can't be two of these people. Surely there can't be two people that have this passion. Surely there can't be two people that have this boldness for the gospel. And yet there was. The idea that you shouldn't come to church and have your sins confronted. The idea that you come to church and you don't want to be bothered with the things of the word of God that affect your life is totally the opposite of the message that you would have received at the voice of Jesus Christ or John the Baptist. The message that was delivered here in this time was to turn people's hearts back to the Lord. It was a message that caused people to want to repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the saying always goes, before someone can ever repent of their sin, they must first realize that they are a sinner. This is not the age of feel good. And by the way, it's not the age of feel good now. It's not what the nation needs today. If ever a nation could have this today where the hearts of their fathers would turn back towards the children. If we ever had an age where it would be good that fathers were fathers in the home. Where sinners would repent and turn to Christ. It is the same age that we are in today. Well, what's the recipe? Have faith in the word of God. Preach the word of God with boldness. Do not waver. Do not back down. It doesn't matter if you're before Herod. It doesn't matter if you stand before Agrippa. It doesn't matter if it's Herod Antipodes. It doesn't matter if it's the president. It does not matter. The power rests inside of the word of God. And in here alone is the key to changing the world. I want to leave feeling joyful. I want to leave feeling excited. Listen, This morning, I did not want to get up. My alarm clock went off, silence. It went off again, and I silenced it. And I don't know why it's every eight minutes. You think if you silence an alarm clock, it should be 30 minutes, but it's not. And so I silenced my alarm clock, and I silenced my alarm clock because I did not want to get up. But you know what happens after a couple silences of the alarm clock? and it goes off again, now we have two people in the room who's disgruntled, me and my wife, because now she's getting woke up. She's tired of hearing the alarm, disgruntled with the alarm, but instead of giving the proper response to the alarm, meaning get up and do something, I just hit silence again. You know, I think that's where people are oftentimes with the word of God. They hear the word of God. They hear the alarm. They hear the sounding. They hear the fact that you're living in sin. They hear the truth that if you do not repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, that you will spend eternity in hell. They hear the alarm. They hear it sounding. And instead of doing a response, instead of heeding the word of God, instead of repenting of their sins and placing their faith in Jesus Christ, they become more and more disgruntled with the truth and hit silence. They don't respond to the word. They don't respond to truth. And you know what happens? Even in Christians' lives, when you know that there's sin in your life, when you know that there's an area in your life that is not wholly given to God, it's like you're continuing to hit the silence alarm. I'll get it right one day. I'm going to take care of the sin in my life one day. I'm going to handle this one day. But that one day is not today. And you know what happens? Do you know what happens? It only takes over more and more space. You know what happened if I would have continued to hit the silence this morning and continued on and continued on? I would have been late for everything that was planned this morning. Listen, the word of God is an alarm to the hearts of the believer and the unbeliever. And for the believer, it is alarm to say, listen, this is the path that you can have to be closer to God. This is the path that it takes to draw nigh to the Lord. And anything in between here, anything that you do not commit to here, prohibits the closer walk. For the unbeliever, it is the alarm, the warning that what is coming for you is soon coming judgment. You know, there's a difference between hearing and heeding. This passage brings about its own trouble in which we will soon see. Herod used to love to hear John 
preach. We read that. He used to love it. He loved to hear John preach. What was the changing point when John's message handled his sin? That's where it changed. He used to love to hear the word of God, but when it swerved over to how it affected his life, there was a big issue. I think that oftentimes we get offended. In, in the world, we see it every day. They, get, they, they love the word. Oh, I love reading the poetry of the Psalms. But when it pricks them, they're done. And this is where Herod was until John's message affected his heart. Oftentimes, visitors will love a preacher if he'll just say the soft things, if he'll just say the enjoyable things. But as I said earlier, John is the kind of preacher that would call the sinner to repent. He was letting them know that it was time for the remissions of sins. It was time to repent. He was letting them know that it's time to hear this message. You may say, why is this so important? Why is this so important, the caliber of preacher John was? Why is it so important to take time and give emphasis about who John the Baptist was? Because him and Jesus Christ were the same. Not, not the same person. No, no, no. But they had the same message. They had the same passion. They had the same boldness in the word. They could preach truth. And the truth is, truth troubles sin. Whether you're saved or lost. What is contained in these 66 books is to draw us closer to God. It's to draw the unbelieving soul to the truth. It's to make you realize where you are. I know that oftentimes, even when we go out and we preach the gospel, or we share the gospel with our co-workers, oftentimes it's not received well. They don't take a liking to the word of God. They don't like the, the fact that the word Word of God condemns them in their sin and they don't like the fact that the word of God condemns them in the things that they think they enjoy in this life nevertheless yet it is our responsibility to preach the word I heard one preacher say that babies always cry when they're first woke up and I think it's often true if you think about it when the word of God is preached when people are first made aware of their condition and when they don't like it they're upset they're aggravated of where you have brought them to in the word of God and what will this this here in this verses 14 through 29 we'll see what truth will do and we'll see what truth did for john the baptist truth killed the preacher um, but they still didn't silence the message and they didn't fix their consciousness it still burned in them john's dead but the the message still hunted herod's house and john's dead but the message still goes on inside of them here we have the account of the death of a man who passionately preached and it offended a woman who could use her own daughter to draw her very own husband further into sin by taking the life of an innocent man. We turn the page in the gospel now and are forced to pause and ask ourselves when we have seen the word rejected. We have seen people hear the message and remain in unbelief. And we say, okay, you, you know that we can handle that. We, we can handle the fact that as we go out and we preach the word that people may remain in unbelief. Oh, we, we can handle the fact that maybe when we go up onto somebody's porch and we preach the gospel to them, they slam the door in our face and, and, and tell us to get off their porch, get out of their yard. I mean, this is the rejection that they experienced in Nazareth, right? Get out of our city, get out of our village, leave us alone. We can handle that kind of rejection. We see that John the Baptist was in prison for his faith. John the Baptist was in prison for his message. We ask our ourselves, you know what, maybe we can handle that. And maybe we could handle possibly be imprisoned for preaching the word of God. But here we're forced to ask ourselves, how strong is our faith? Verses 14 through 29 tell about John the Baptist, who was a preacher, 
who believed so much in the truth of the word of God, the, the message that was in his heart, the message that was upon his lips, he was willing to confront a king with it. He was willing to confront a people with it. He was willing to face a guillotine for it. He was willing to die for this message. Before the services started this morning, me and Jason was going back and forth. Brother Reinhardt was going back and forth about the Sunday school, about people who died so that we could have the word of God. So that we could have it here in English. And, you know, oftentimes if, if we search our hearts, you know, people were put to death just for the Ten Commandments, for teaching their kids the Ten Commandments. People were put to death just for teaching their children the Lord's Prayer. And yet, here we are, all these years later. Although we leave here and there's Bibles everywhere. We probably have Bibles everywhere in our home. We, there's 500, 600 Bibles, it seems like, in every store. The Word of God seems to be everywhere, yet there seems to be less of heart for the Word of God than ever. We've taken for granted that it's so readily accessible. We've taken for granted what this word actually means to us. Taken for granted the power that rests in this word. Yet we have John the Baptist who said, you know what? I love God's word so much. I love the truth of God's word. I believe this message so much that instead of recanting it, I'm willing to die for it. If you was to stand today, and we all have to ask this even for ourselves. Our challenge is to ask ourselves, would you die for your faith today? Do you believe even, you know what, whether you have a, a, a grandkid on the way, a child on the way, or whatever you may have, the, maybe you're at the peak of your life. This is the moment that you've worked your entire life for. You saved for. Now you're heading into retirement. You're in the golden years. And this is the moment that you've enjoyed, that you've planned for your whole life. You love your little family. If it was interrupted today, would you be willing to sacrifice all that you have here instead of recanting all that you believe here? See, this is the challenge that we face. John was sold out for the word of God. And listen, if you're worried what would happen, you're not alone. I say all the time, even in my heart, even in conversation, if that ever happened to me, I pray that God would give me the faith to handle it. Because as we talked about Wednesday night, I'll run from a noise. I to fear things. But the thing that we see here is that through God's grace and through God's help, there is an amount of faith can, that can be given that you're willing to give it all for the cause of Christ. Now, in the same breath as this, that John the Baptist was willing to die for it, there's also a statement to say that John the Baptist was willing to live his all for it. Not only is John willing to die, um, but while he wasn't facing the guillotine, he literally gave his all to preaching the word of God. He literally gave everything he had to get the word of God out. This was in his bones. Is our faith enough to confront a king, uh, to face the guillotine, to not waver? John's faith did. Herod had a choice, and so did Herodias, but they made a bad choice. It says, and King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. John the Baptist at this point has now deceased. He's now dead. Uh, while that's definitely sad news, that John is now gone. Uh, this is not what bothered Herod, that John was dead. What bothered Herod was the thought that John was not dead, that John was in fact alive. Um, why? Because he even, here con um, he even here confesses it, that he was the one that put him to death. 
I think it's safe to say that, well, you know, we can't be accurate about the exact timeline, but during this time, in this moment, that John the Baptist was probably dead for a couple months already. Yet when Herod hears this, it's the first thing out of his mouth. <clears throat> when Herod hears this, it's the first thing out of his lips. Wait, Herod, John the Baptist is dead. I thought it was over. But now the news comes, and we see in this text the power of one's conscience. In the lengths people will go to not have to face the reality of their mistakes. You know, it amazes me that in this very moment that Herod is so worked up when he hears about Jesus Christ and he hears about the power of his preaching, immediately he is trembling with fear that it might be John the Baptist and he's going to take efforts. You can see even in the book of Matthew and Luke that he wants to know more. Is this really John the Baptist? Bring him. Let me see him. Let me see if it's really him. Why is he so worried about covering up or handling the mistakes that he already made again? Why didn't Herod just heed the message? Herod, it's time to repent. Herod, it's time to make things right. But yet Herod gladly heard the message. But yet in his mind, in his conscience, when he is faced with the message again, you know what he does? Goes further steps to even cover it. And the lengths that people will go to instead of facing the reality of their mistakes. Herod had heard about Jesus. He had heard about his disciples. And in Herod's mind, there was no doubt it was him. And no doubt in his mind, it was true. I've heard about, I've heard a man who has this kind of boldness. I've heard a man who preaches with power in his voice like this. I know the boldness of this man. I know this man. And this is none other than John the Baptist. And this is what he said. But that's not all. He goes on even further. The idea that's given here in this tense, in this text, when Herod says it is John the Baptist, even when it goes on to verse 16, he said, but when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John. When you see that in there, the tense of that is to say, listen, other offers have been given up. People are trying to reason this away. People are trying to bring Herod to a point of peace. But in Herod's mind, in this tense, it is like Herod was continuing to say, it is is John. It is John. It is John. And this is John. There's no one else it could be. And this is John who's preaching like this again. And this is John who's teaching like this. And this is John who's alive again. And Herod was troubled. He was extremely nervous. Because why? Herod knew John's message. And by the time this has arrived here, the fact is, is that there's a serious issue and that this man with power in his voice is here. He's alive again, but in Herod's mind, he killed him. He's just unable to think that there could be two people with power in their voice. There were two people preaching this message with boldness. Let that be the kind of testimony of the preachers that these men were, that Jesus was. And Jesus said of John the Baptist that there was no greater man born of a woman. And John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And this is the kind of preachers they were. In verse 14, Herod believed he was alive again. And we will see this morning, one day, John would be standing before Herod, and while he sat on the throne, while others feared Herod, and while others bowed to him, while others were scared of him, while others were so fearful of him, he came from a long line of wickedness. Remember, and this is Herod Antipodus, his father was Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the man who put all of those children to death, attempting to kill Jesus Christ. Herod the Great was the same man when the Jewish council wouldn't heed to what he was saying, when they wouldn't follow after him. He killed the 70 Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin. He killed them all. Matter of fact, Herod the Great was so wicked when he felt like his children were coming up behind him and might be too close to taking over the throne. 
he had them put to death also. Caesar, who Herod would answer to, said of Herod that it is, I would rather be Herod's pig than Herod's son. And this is the wickedness that existed in this line. And this is the lineage of Herod. And now this is Herod the great son, Herod Antipodes. And you know what? When, when Herod the great deceased, the kingdom was broke up amongst four people, four of Herod's sons. So they didn't have the same authority that Herod the great had. But you know what they did inherit? They inherited his immoral, his wicked, evil lifestyle and that's what they inherited from their father they were just as nasty and vile as their father was their reputation is known abroad this is who john the baptist would be standing in front of a, a long lineage of murderers a, a lineage of men who were known to bring harm upon the people in which they ruled john did not have a crown standing upon or uh, sitting upon his head John did not have a huge army standing behind him. Well, what made John so bold? To me, standing before Herod is like facing the guillotine twice. Standing before Herod and making this stand, knowing that they put people to death, knowing that they're heartless, knowing that they're going to kill you, knowing that they, this is how they live. John, are you going to soften the message? John, are you going to censor the message? John, be careful in your footing. No, John continued to preach the word and he did not waver. John, we'll see in verses 17 through, uh, well, verses 17 through 29, not only is John the kind of preacher who calls out sin but John is the kind of preacher who'll call out your sin and he doesn't even care who you are you know why you know what makes John the Baptist so bold truth John the Baptist stood on truth it is a reminder to us it is an encouragement to us if we will just realize what truth is I think oftentimes we forget it you know, I think oftentimes we forget what that means when we say, well, that's the truth. When we say, well, this is what the Bible says, it means that this is the absolute. There is no other option. There's no other opinion to even worry about being offered. There's no reason to try to fit this in your purse. It will not fit unless you're walking along with the Lord. He delivered truth. And you know what this truth did? It made Herod afraid. Wait a minute. You just said that Herod was a killer. He is. You just said that Herod was known for killing Christians. Yeah, absolutely. You just said that Herod was feared amongst the land. Yeah, that's right. This is how wicked and evil their whole family was. But you just said that when he preached the word to Herod, Herod was afraid. And that's right. Why? That is the power of truth. That's the power of the word. And this is what we see even throughout the entire New Testament. When Christians, when, when people stand before the rulers of their day and truth is delivered, it changes the demeanor. Listen, we don't have to be these, you know, gladiator people. We don't have to be these burly people. We don't have to be any of those things. You know, we have to be people who are faithful to the word of God. Do you remember what happened when Paul stood before Felix in Acts chapter 24? You remember when he stood before Felix? I think it's Acts 24 and verse 25. And he preached righteousness unto Felix. Here he is standing before the leader of the Day. He preached righteousness. He preached temperance. And he preached about a judgment to come. And do you know what we find about Felix? We find that Felix laughed it off. We find that Felix threw Paul out. We find that Felix said that you're just the biggest joke. No. We find that after Paul delivered 
delivered this gospel message to Felix about righteousness and about a judgment that was to come. Felix forgot his crown. He forgot his golden chair. He forgot the robe he was wearing. He forgot the kingdom that he was over. The Bible says in Acts 24 that Felix began to tremble. He trembled in his seat. He trembled in where he was sitting. I wonder if Paul could hear his knees chatter and his knees clatter. What happened? You're this great leader, Felix. No, what happened was there is so much power in truth. We cannot disregard who can be the recipient of it, no matter what their position is, no matter what their name is. Yes, it's going to cost this man his life. But you know what else it did? It troubled his Herod's conscience for the rest of his days. And same for Herodias. You cannot escape truth. You can kill the messenger. You can silence the messenger, but you can't get the seed out of you. You can't get the word away from you. You can't you can't let it flee from you. I've said it many times. December 28, 2008, I was alone. And the seed was planted long before. But it sprung forth new life. We'll see here. Herod could not escape the truth that was given to him. He was troubled. Even more to think about it. Remember when Paul stood before Agrippa? You remember? <laughs> Paul delivered this message, this truth, this power, this powerful message to Agrippa. And he delivered this message. And Agrippa said, Paul, thou hast almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Listen, we can't take this one reference here from John the Baptist and say, you know what? You know, that's what happens when you stand up against government on truth. This is what happens when you stand up against leaders on truth. No, because, listen, the word of God has the power to convict of sin. It has the power to make one tremble. And it has um, the power to bring another man to a point where he realizes that he is in desperate need of Christ. This is what we see here. Verse 15 offers some insight about Herod. Herod was literally shaking in his sandals, thinking the preacher is back. And others said, and that is Elias. And others said, and that is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. <laughs> you know, I'll say this in closing, and we're going to pick this up back up tonight. We've seen all around Cincinnati, even in the last year, how many council leaders have been in trouble. One testimony was, had took the advice from the wrong person. I took the advice from the wrong people. I I listened to the wrong people and it led me further down a situation that costed me my freedom, It costed me my family. It costed me my home. Well, what happened? They were surrounded with bad counsel. What we see here in verse 15, when it says others said that it is Elias and others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets, what you're seeing here is people offering up to Herod terrible counsel. Herod. This isn't John the Baptist. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mm, this, is, this is exactly who this is. Quit, quit letting your conscience get the best of you. Quit trying to discredit what he's saying. Herod's conscience is hunting him. But the truth is this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the truth is for us this morning, and this is exactly who this person is. And this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this is the one that John the Baptist was willing to die for because of what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was preparing to do. He had faith of yet was yet to come. Even today in our own world right now, we are surrounded by religions who say that, you know what, we have the same God. I say, you know what? I believe in the God of the Old Testament, too. That's what the Muslim faith says. We got the same God. You know what? Even the Jewish faith says, you know what? We serve the same God. Hey, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what? Even the world today will even say about Jesus, 
They'll say, they'll compare him to Confucius. You know, he, he's a good man like Confucius. Oh, you know, he's a prophet like Muhammad. He, he's, a, he's a equal to Buddha. Listen, if you walk out of here taking the advice from anyone else, you're doing exactly what Herod is doing. Bad advice leads to bigger problems. The truth is, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the message that John preached, that this is the Son of God. Yet the world offers it up. And the world offers it up. You know what? He's good. He's nice. He's, a, oh, he's an okay guy. No, he's so much more than that. With what authority do we do? With what authority do we make such a stance? With what authority do we have so much power? We have the word of God. Listen, don't waver. Don't waver and say, well, you know, and it's just a book. Don't waver. Don't allow your conscience to pull you back. Listen, this message was delivered to many leaders in their day. And you know what? It caused them to tremble. Why? Because the power that rests in truth. Listen, the power is in this book. When people say, well, you know, Jesus is he's the son of God. Well, he's not really the sa He is the savior. That's exactly who he says. Well, under whose authority? His own. Argue it. He is the Son of God. He was, came into this earth. He lived a sinless, spotless life for 33 years. He died on Calvary's hill for the atonement of our sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day later. You don't want to compare him to Buddha, because where's Buddha? In the grave. Don't compare him to Muhammad, because Muhammad is in the grave. Don't compare him to any other religious leader of this world because they're all still in the grave. And I, I serve a risen Savior. And when we get a hold of the fact that we serve a risen Savior, when we get a hold of the fact of the power that is the, of the truth that is in this word, we're going to start to get a hold of exactly how John the Baptist felt. You know what? The guillotine. I got truth. <laughs> you know what? It's the end of my life. It is the end of my life. But it's just the beginning of my life. If I was taken out of here tomorrow, that means God was finished with me here. If I was taken out of here tomorrow, that means I'm going to be spending forever with my Lord. Death is imminent. Death is imminent. But you know what? At least I'm going to die knowing that I'm standing on truth. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, challenge us and charge us, Lord, to stand on your truth. Uh, help us to draw nigh to you to understand the boldness of John the Baptist. Help us to understand the power of this message, Lord. To understand what this age needs in an age where uh, fathers are not looking to, for their children, when fathers are not taking care of their children, when fathers are not taking care of their home. Help us to understand in this age that what is, needs to be delivered is the gospel message. Lord, may we understand in an age where people are not looking for wisdom uh, from the word of God, when people do not want to behave righteously, when people are not trying to behave justly, when it seems that those who are in authority of us over us be continue to move on even more wickedly, Lord, may we realize it's not arms we need, it's not firearms, so to say, Lord, it's not the rations and the caches and all of the things that we like in our life, Lord, though it sounds good, Lord, Lord, give us the strength that in this moment, in this time, as we're cornered, as we're moving on, that the word of God flows from our hearts and lips, causing others to realize where they stand before you. Lord, they stand before nothing in, in my presence, but in the presence of truth, Lord. We've seen today in the word, even the kings of this world have been brought to tremble. Such power in your word, such power in this truth. May we never forget it. In Jesus' name, amen.